Coming up next on the SPNN Forum, we'll sit with Bo Tao Yurabi from the Coalition of Asian American Leaders. Hi, I'm Martin Ludden, Executive Director of the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, and we're here on the SPNN Forum with Bo Tao Yurabi, Executive Director of the Coalition of Asian American Leaders. Bo, welcome to the forum. Thanks for having me. It's yeah. a pleasure. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the Coalition of Asian American Leaders does? Sure. So we are a nonprofit network. Uh, that just means that we bring leaders from all different sectors, uh, different ethnic groups and age groups together. Mm -hmm. Uh, for a couple things. One is really so that they can uh, get to meet and learn about each other. Uh, on, on, you know, uh, people might assume that because we're Asians, people know every, you know, you know each other, but that's yeah. not true. And so uh, finding ways for leaders to connect with each other. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that we do uh, together is really to look at what matters to the community and to find ways to work on those things. So we do research and policy work mm -hmm. and uh, we do a lot of community, uh, uh, aware, raising community awareness and building community power to be able to ask for the things that they need, yeah, to make their lives in Minnesota better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are you convening, you know, mm -hmm. with your, I don't know, how big is your team? Um, we have a team of uh, now 10 people. Okay. Yeah. And so you're convening leaders from other places to yes. do this work? Well, the network itself has yeah. over 3,000 people, wow. so it's yeah. quite a lot of people, and that means that we are uh, often hosting events, trainings, mm -hmm. um, and really uh, setting agenda together. So doing a lot of things together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to meet lots of people. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, mm -hmm. And what's kind of, what are the big things you're working on right now? So we do, um, we host a lot of events throughout the year where it's either on topics or leaders that we think um, are important to uh, highlight mm -hmm. uh, and, and important issues that uh, impact the community that leaders should just know about. Yeah. Um, and then we do also leadership uh, uh, development work. So we have training institutes, but we also um, bring people together to learn specific skills um, and things like that. And then on the issues-based work, we work very closely in, the, in education. Uh, we also work on economics and immigration, and yeah. so on those issues, we, you know, we try to really think about uh, what are the specifics within those issues mm -hmm. that are uh, in the way of the community being able to uh, thrive in Minnesota. Yeah. And then we do research on that, and we we look at policy, and then we also work closely with the communities to be able to um, think about uh, what. What, what it is that we can do to ensure that they can actually be successful here in Minnesota. And so you're mm -hmm. kind of arming these leaders, yeah. or equipping them with like the information and the, the situational awareness right. to go and advocate, right? Right, yes, yeah. that's a big part of it, is yeah. helping them to be advocates, but helping them to also bring impacted individuals from, from their own communities mm -hmm. to be able to speak for themselves, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard you talk about immigration, yeah. and I think yeah. um, you know when we think about the Hmong mm -hmm. community, especially in St. Paul, right. I don't think we think about mm -hmm. new yes. immigration in that way that mm -hmm. we traditionally think about immigration because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the community is so established. So, right. kind of, what issues are you working on there? Right. Um, so, on immigration, I mean, certainly right now we are knee deep in really addressing the issue of uh, that is most recently impacting the community around e deportation. Yeah. Um, and so, as you said, this is not a new community uh, per se. It's really a community that um, uh, is, um, is still fairly young, but it's into its second generation mm -hmm. of children here in America. Um, and Hmong and Lao Americans who are here in Minnesota really came as a part of the largest wave of refugees ever to be resettled in this country post the Vietnam and secret wars in Laos, right? Yeah. So they came as a uh, part of that wave and, um, and uh, uh, made choose or chose to make Minnesota home um, because people felt like uh, this was a state where they had, um, they, they, they were able to maybe get support and mm -hmm. then also uh, find economic opportunities yeah. where they could 
achieve their American dreams, right? So, um, so they've chosen to make Minnesota home and have here, been here for many decades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit, just you know, for mm -hmm. folks that might not be somehow living in St. Paul and aware, right. kind of what that situation yeah. looked like with yeah. uh, the Vietnam War and yeah. the secret wars in mm -hmm. Laos and where mm -hmm. the Hmong and Lao people sure. came into that? Mm -hmm. So during the Vietnam War, uh, Laos, it, which is a country that neighbors uh, mm -hmm. Vietnam, was supposed to be a neutral country, but it was used to move a lot of supply lines from north to south Vietnam. And so the US CIA uh, ran missions there, and because they couldn't have uh, foot soldiers on the ground, they recruited the Hmong um, and Lao and other ethnic uh, soldiers from Laos uh, to serve as their guerrilla units on the ground um, with specific missions to either uh, you know, disrupt supply lines right. uh, or to rescue down American pilots. Mm. And so my father was one of those uh, uh, soldiers and you know, he told me about a time when he and uh, his unit went to rescue a down American pilot and they lost over 20 men. Um, to rescue the American pilot, right? So that was a relationship that um, uh, that the community uh, had with uh, America, although right. many Americans didn't know about it yeah. because it was a secret war. And, uh, and so after the war, uh, when the U.S. left both um, uh, all of Southeast Asia pretty mm -hmm. much, uh, these were um, these communities became the targets, right, for um, both re-education and, in some cases, real extinction. Right. So, um, so that's kind of the historical context, yeah. and then many people made their way, just like my family, to refugee camps, mm -hmm. and then eventually um, asked to be resettled in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that that kind of <clears throat> excuse me that. Um, that first immigration mm -hmm. kind of from those refugee camps mostly in Thailand? Most people came through refugee camps in Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, there are some people who, um, you know, might have gone to other countries like the Philippines okay. or things like that. And then some people might have chosen other first resettlement countries like France or yeah. things like that and then eventually decided they had most of their relatives here in America, okay. so reunited with them here. But um, most Hmong uh, refugees at, um, uh, from that war came here to America. And that mm -hmm. was late 70s through the early 80s, right? Late 70s, really all through probably the, the uh, early 90s oh, wow. was okay. like the big waves. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now, you know, a, a community that has been here yeah. for the better part of right. 20 or 30 years. Right. Um, and what's the, what are the worries on mm -hmm. deportation mm -hmm. now? So the community is very concerned about deportation because of the recent actions by the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. uh, we recently learned in late January that the Department of State and the Department of Homeland Security were aggressively pursuing the deportation of, uh, of people who had removal orders from the, uh, and had their heritage uh, in Laos. And mm -hmm. so uh, this means that if you are not a citizen and you have a removal order and you can trace your heritage to Laos, that they are trying to pursue um, deporting you, right? And mm -hmm. so the community became really concerned because, um, uh, because the immigration laws changed in 1996. And so when the laws changed, um, it was applied retroactively. And there are many people like me who came as children uh, mm -hmm. and then, um, and then uh, might have uh, uh, committed a crime. And then they could no longer become citizens, but um, their parents um, became citizens or all of those things, but they were not citizens themselves. And then when the law changed, it made them deportable, okay. right? So there's, um, so in 96, uh, a whole new class of uh, 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 criminal sentences that had not been deportable before 96 became mm -hmm. deportable. Okay. And then it was also applied retroactively. So let's say you, Martin, yep. committed a crime, you know, 20 years ago and the law changed in 96 and it mm -hmm. said it's, there's no, uh, it has to be applied retroactively. And so uh, your crime now becomes deportable, yeah. right? And it's not really the crime, but in immigration law, it's more about the sentence, right? right. And so the 96 law, um, it's, it's 
very complex, but some of the simplicities are that if you received a sentence of 365 days or more, um, it made you deportable, right? Oh. So we know. So now it doesn't matter if it's a misdemeanor or felony, no, whatever. No, it's okay. not looking at that kind of, mm. and felony and immigration uh, is not the same as felony in, uh, in, in right. criminal law. <laughs> so, you know, those things are complex in the community. Then there was a whole group of um, uh, individuals, I would say, who are uh, like me, who mm -hmm. came as children. They um, made mistakes in their life, yeah. and then they received uh, sentences. They served their time, the law changed, and then they were um, picked up by immigration yeah. and were given removal orders. Um, many could probably have fought their case, but mm -hmm. in immigration court uh, or when you are detained, um, you have a right to an attorney, but it's not their job. Unlike criminal court where you have, you, if you don't have money for an attorney, they give you a public defender. Yeah. In immigration court, they don't have to do that. So you either afford it or <laughs> you don't. Right. And so uh, during that time, uh, there were many people who um, who just voluntarily signed removal orders because they wanted to come home, right? And in one case, one uh, who, one gentleman who you know is around my age, um, he said, you know, when he was in ICE, or at that time it was an ICE, yeah, right. it was just immigration uh, detention center. He um, he was told, well, if you sign this, you'll get to go home and, you know, after 90 days, because if you don't sign this, then, you know, we don't know how long you'll be here. And he didn't have an attorney, his family was poor, and he decided to sign it, and then he uh, was let go. And that was partly because um, uh, uh, immigration could not detain people inde indefinitely if there was no way to deport them, right? So okay. then, uh, so then they had to let people come back home. Yeah. And when you say come home, I mean that's yeah. that's home to you know home to the their house, families. The house yeah. in St. Paul. You know, yes, not, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> home uh, to their and and um, and so you know these often were people who had served their sentences. Right. Then they were picked up by immigration, and then they uh, uh, they either went through immigration court or they signed some uh, you know voluntary removal uh, agreement and then were allowed to come home. And so those individuals then came home and many established, um, you know, you grow up and yeah. a lot of people uh, then, you know, had families, mm -hmm. work jobs, yep. became professionals. And so for many years they didn't, they didn't really think deportation was going to impact them because the country of Laos had always said, um, we don't want to negotiate the return of refugees who right. went to the U.S. because those were the people that fought against us, right? So we yeah. don't want them back. Yeah. Um, and if they've chosen to leave, it means they are no longer Lao nationals, right? So, right. Um, so they have refused to uh, negotiate, and that's why there was never a deportation agreement between okay. the two countries, yeah. And now is it the case that the current administration is kind of opening up a mm -hmm. renegotiation of that status? Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's a, ne a renegotiation, but it's more like uh, pressure, right? Mm. <laughs> so pressure yeah. in the forms of yeah. like they, um, <clears throat> they are doing things like not giving Lao uh, diplomats visas to come mm. to the U.S. or threatening sanctions or other kinds of uh, aid cuts and things. And so yeah. I think that means that there's pressure for the country to start um, thinking about taking uh, uh, people with removal orders back, right? And then also uh, we learned that on the ground in Laos, USAID started funding what they're calling a transitional facility. Oh. Um, so they're uh, establishing a facility to receive people who don't speak Lao and who don't have family relations in Laos. And so um, that goes everything that sort of is indicators to us that there's a, a very uh, aggressive move to right. receive even the refugees. And many people like myself don't speak the language and may not have any relationships over there. So um, that means that they're, start, they're looking to um, deport individuals, not just those who, who have uh, family relationships or mm -hmm. who um, speak the language or all of those things, but they're looking to deport refugees who have re removal orders mm -hmm. and have been away from the country for many decades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
If you're just joining us, we are here on the SPNN Forum with Bo Tao Yarabi, the Executive Director of the Coalition of Asian American Leaders, and we're talking about potential deportation for Hmong and Lao refugees. Mm -hmm. um, so you're yeah. talking about folks who, you know, at some point, you know, between now and 20 yeah. years ago, right. committed um, a crime, served a sentence, and then somewhere in that process, yeah were assigned or voluntarily, and we'll use voluntarily very yeah. loosely, yes. um, signed a, a, a removal mm -hmm. agreement. Mm -hmm. And between now and then, mm -hmm. before now, those agreements have just kind of sat on a shelf somewhere and yeah. have not really been enforced. Well, there have been no agreements because the Lao government refused to negotiate, mm -hmm. right? So there were no agreements, and I think that's why, um, that's why people came back and lived their lives and they right. didn't prepare for deportation yeah. um, and, and things like that. And, and uh, or individuals were told that Laos was not a priority. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, in the case of the uh, gentleman who told me that um, he was told by his immigration officer right. to go ahead and sign it because uh, people like him were not in, in, you know, didn't have to yeah. worry about deportation because their countries were not right. priority. So he was desperate to come home. He didn't yeah. have an attorney and or money to hire an attorney. Right. And so he came home, right? right. Um, he signed it and he came home. And, you know, uh, 20 years later, right. uh, this news is just, uh, I think, been very emotionally draining yeah. for him. And now he says, you know, I won't let people come over because I don't know if it, if, you know, if it means ICE will pick me up, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I think when I meant when I said removal yeah. agreement, I meant um, yeah. what do you what do you call the document that he signed? A removal order. A removal order. Yes. Right. So mm -hmm. those those orders all exist. Right. Somewhere. Yes, they do and now exist. Now they're being revisited. Yeah. No, anybody that has a removal order knows mm -hmm. that they okay. have a removal order because um, essentially what happens is that um, then. Uh, uh, if um, you have a removal order, um, people take the immigration officers take your green card away, okay. and then you, in essence, replace that with a work permit, right? So that you can come back to okay. work, and so, and then they either visit them annually, every six months or every three months. But those check-ins have sort of just been to sort of say, right. how are you know. Um, pay for your next work permit yeah. <laughs> and and uh, continue on with your life. So there were, I think, um, no real concerns. And in the case of this gentleman, he never even told his American-born children, right? Um, because he felt so ashamed that yeah. this was his crime, but he thought he paid for it and he was starting mm -hmm. his life and he didn't tell them. And so now his his children are both in college and now with everything, he's like, I, I can't believe it's all like coming back, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think, uh, um, you know, he just feels incredibly ashamed of mm -hmm. the things that he did because um, he was young and he was poor and he yeah. uh, fell into, um, you know, things that he he's not proud of, right? right. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, came through that. And came and through that, went to college, college yeah. uh, had children, and now, it, you know, uh, uh, has been working for over 20 plus years yeah. to build his family and um, now to have this, it feels like a lifetime sentence, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm, to have that. Uh, and so, you know, this is not a law that just impacts Hmong Americans or uh, the Hmong and Lao community, but it in fact impacts all refugee populations, right? Yeah. And I think what's unique about uh, the Hmong situation is that the law changed you know, in between that right. time when when the community came and then the law changed. And people often tell me like, well, shouldn't people know that, you know, there's, there's you know, there's laws. And I tell people laws can change, yeah. right? <laughs> um, things that were not deportable yesterday become deportable right. today. And so uh, all of those things are determined by our congressional members at the mm -hmm. national level and also lots of different world events and yeah. um, and and certainly you know um, I think we all are concerned about keeping you know America safe and keeping uh, uh, our communities um, uh, healthy and vibrant but also mm -hmm. I think 
it's beholden on us to right. think about how, how do we actually um, give people second chances yeah. because no one is perfect, um, but also um, how do we make sure that um, when we welcome refugees that we also um, uh, uh, give them the same opportunities that we would any right. Americans when they make mistakes. Yeah. yeah. Well, mm -hmm. almost by definition, you know, a refugee to this yeah. country doesn't necessarily have right. anything to go back to. to right. Mm -hmm. So, yes, in a lot of cases, refugees are deported um, back to countries from which they escaped. Right, yeah. and so um, I have had people call me, and that's been a huge concern. They mm -hmm. say, "Well, my father served in the U with the USCIA. Does that mm -hmm. mean when I go back, I will be a target? Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm deported back?" Um, so those are huge concerns. Right, these are not; they're not returning. Um, from you know uh, just overstaying a visa, these are right. people who escaped uh, really for their lives, right? Yeah. And so to to be threatened with deportation is quite scary for the individual and for the families. Mm -hmm. Is that what's the political um, situation in Laos now? Yeah. Is that is that a, a real concern mm -hmm. that if someone who is associated with or was an mm -hmm. active participant in the mm -hmm. secret war, mm -hmm. um, are they a target? Um, you know, most of the people that sided with the U.S. Um, became refugees and have been resettled in other countries, the majority here. Um, but there's still a, a small group of people who are still in the jungles because they they don't feel safe coming out and have lived in the jungles for yeah. over 40 years, right, um, because they sided with the U.S. And so um, there have been documentaries about them and mm -hmm. all of those things. And so I think that, um, you know, that does not give anybody uh, comfort that, uh, that we should not be concerned about the human rights uh, uh, um, of people who are in Laos, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of in the midst of this mm -hmm really yeah. complicated swirl. Mm -hmm. where does, yes, where complicated does, yeah. is a good way. Um, where does Cal yeah. sit and what kind mm -hmm. of work are you doing mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. this? Well, I think immediately we're trying to make sure that the community has good information, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, just being clear that there is no deportation order, but this administration has said that they don't need uh, agreements, right? Yeah. Or, or, I mean, I don't mean deportation order, deportation agreements right. with Laos. Um, and then also, um, but by their actions, we see a very aggressive uh, uh, and proactive movement to do that. Yeah. Um, and then also, secondly, that um, we are working at looking at city, county, state, federal policies to see yeah. where there could be some immediate relief um, brought to uh, to some families and individuals. And then also making sure that we are working with our um, uh, legal service providers to prepare to um, better serve this community because mm -hmm. for a long time, this was not a population that many people uh, provided services for. Mm -hmm. So there's not language accessible services and that's yep. why people are calling us. Yeah. Um, and then also um, there's very few, I think, um, attorneys who understand the intersections between criminal law and immigration yeah. law and you need that expertise, right, right in order to work on this issue. So, um, so getting kind of that kind of help for mm -hmm. at a uh, low and pro bono <laughs> yep. rate so that it can be yeah. affordable because we do think there are some cases who could get, um, if they took the legal route, could get some relief, right? And then ultimately to support families and individuals who are going through this, right? Yeah. Because it's taking emotional, physical tolls on them. So making sure that there is support for them and their families yeah. and also so they don't feel hopeless that there's something they can still do, um, whether that's about their individual case or about helping to shape policy or helping to educate the general public mm -hmm. about why this is not a, uh, a road in which we think that helps communities to thrive here. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would imagine this trauma, yeah. you know, this uncertainty and this trauma lays on top of yeah. deep historical trauma That's right. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I think that layering of trauma um, absolutely um, is true, and we know that there are other communities like the Cambodian and Vietnamese mm -hmm. communities who have experienced deportations for many years now, and there continues to be ICE raids in their communities, and we have seen some of the individuals who have been 
repatriated and have seen that when they arrive in Cambodia, they are impoverished because they don't speak the language. Right. Um, oftentimes, the government doesn't help them to get documents, so they can't work. And, right. and, so, and then that means that the family in America ends up having to send money. And so it causes this cycle of poverty, right? right? So I think all of those stressors are hard for people to imagine. Um, but we also want want families to um, to know um, what all of their options are yeah. and to be planful about that, even though it is a very hard thing, right? Um, yeah. But until the law changes, it's hard, mm -hmm. right? But I think that's the um, that's our hope for democracy: is yeah. that if we collectively can say this is something we don't want then we may be able to prevent it. But that's hard to tell somebody who was directly impacted yeah. today, right? Well, and it's, that, it's a longer game. Yeah, that it's a 10-year road yeah. <laughs> in order for that policy to change. So, yeah. um, but I certainly hope that your viewers and the general public um, uh, understand that um, when refugees come here, they're not looking to go back, right? In yeah. fact, they're coming here to be part of this country and part of their communities. and. Yes, there is a struggle to acculturate and mm -hmm. to rebuild their lives here. But for the most part, um, people um, have aspirations and they do their best and uh, they become contributing community members. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, we want to be able to support them in that journey. And especially for refugees who, in this case, uh, Southeast Asian and Hmong and Lao refugees who came under very difficult circumstances. And literally, my family came with two plastic bags, right, yeah. of uh, just clothes and our most important documents, not money, unfortunately. <laughs> and so having to rebuild from that means that my parents, um, uh, who came with very little education, afforded me the opportunity to get an education. But along the way, um, if we had made any mistakes, we would yeah. not be able to be where we are today, right? Mm -hmm. If folks are looking for more information or ways yeah. to get involved in this, what's, right. what's the best bet? Um, well, they can certainly contact us because we're working on this issue from lots of different angles. Mm -hmm. So if you want to volunteer or if you have legal expertise, yeah. not you don't have to be the person who does the case review, but even right. to help us do intakes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we are quite overwhelmed by that right now. <laughs> People are calling us from all over the country. Oh, wow. um, and so that's difficult. And then just, you know, thinking about policy strategies and then also just... Um, uh, finding financial support to, um, we established two support groups, one for individuals who have removal orders and the other for families, mm -hmm. um, because the families are also uh, needing uh, just um, support as they are going through this very difficult situation. Um, also, we want to continue to uh, run community clinics and community uh, education sessions. So I would say please contact us. Our, um, our website is uh, www.calcalmn.org or uh, email us at info at um, And we can definitely find a spot for you. <laughs> <laughs> Volunteers need Yes, it. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, both. Mm -hmm. thank you so much for um, Appreciate taking it. the time today. Yeah. Uh, thank and you. thank you for the work that you and you. Cal are doing. Um, yeah. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having yeah. me. I appreciate it. Yeah. You've been watching the SPNN Forum, and we've been here with Bo Tao Yurabi from the Coalition of Asian American Leaders. Thanks for watching SPNN.